Hey, everybody. Welcome inside the Joey Moss Suite at Commonwealth Stadium. It's time for another season of Antler Up. That's right. Season two has returned. We're going to have more great stories, more great personalities, and all the information you want and need about your favorite CFL team, the Edmonton Elks. This is the first of our weekly episodes. The plan is to drop a new episode the day before every game all season long. Uh, We're going to have a lot of fun all year. Look forward to it. So don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And why not like and share so more people get to hear about Antler Up as well. (whistles) Antler Up, episode 21, Sammy Gahagan. Let's go. (whistles) Touchdown, Antler Up, Edmonton. Touchdown, Elks. Taylor Cornelius takes it himself as he got an open lead to the end zone. Antler Up, Edmonton. Touchdown, Elks. Hey, Sammy, how you doing? Thanks for joining us today. Great, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, a U.S. scout, uh, director of U.S. scouting is your job title. Uh, first off, let's talk about the job. Uh, tell me what that entails. And I'm going to, from what I know about you, it's watching a lot of football. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's more football than I've watched uh, just when I was just with Chris earlier as, a, as an area guy. Um, you know, there's a lot of demand from Chris that we know everybody and and not just in the southeast where I started and where I did most of my work for him early on, but now I need to know people in the Midwest and the West Coast. And so we, I've been watching film on players and teams and schools, and I mean, I, we leave no stone unturned. So we, we're getting after it. How long have you been scouting? Uh, so I started in football in 2002. Uh, as a as a worked in college as a director of football ops for a university. I was a recruiting coordinator for them. And then uh, I worked in the agent business for 10 years, and then I started scouting for uh, Chris in 2016. So I've been a scout for him since then. Where is uh, Lindenwood University? (laughs) So I didn't know where Lindenwood was either. Uh, It's in St. Charles, Missouri, uh, just about 20 minutes outside of downtown St. Louis. Beautiful little town uh, right on the, uh, I believe it's the, I'm going to mess this one up. I believe it's the Ohio River. it's it's a really nice town small it, it's you know I went there in 2004 because my coach from my previous school Ottawa Kansas I was at Ottawa Kansas which funny story there was I went to Ottawa and I thought I was moving to Canada in 2002 <laughs> wait 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 yeah expand upon yeah. that so uh I was coaching high school football I was 25 years old and I was like you know I think I could do this so I called my brother's college in Kansas Kansas Wesleyan and there was a guy there who was recruiting coordinator ended up getting this job at at Ottawa University. So he calls me up. He said, hey, Sammy, you know, I think I can get you in Ottawa University because I was like eight years removed from high school, you know. And uh, I was like, I, could, I was like, I, I, I don't know anything about Canada. He's like, no, 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 there's an Ottawa in Kansas. I was like, oh, okay. So I didn't even visit, didn't know where I was going. I packed up, and I never met any of these people. I have all these people who are just voices to me, nothing more. I packed my car up, and I drove to Ottawa, Kansas. Didn't know what was happening. Didn't know what the school looked like. Nothing. It was unbelievable. That's a leap of faith. It was. And uh, it tested me. Uh, you know, my first two weeks there, I I questioned what I was doing. I remember sitting in my car one day and calling my grandfather. And I was upset. And I was like, I, I'm going to come home. I was like, I don't think this is for what I want to do. And uh, I had a two-hour conversation with him sitting in my car. And uh, that was probably the best conversation I ever had because I stayed. And because of that, I am where I am right now. Interesting. It's, yeah. it's, it's neat. How phone calls change your life. It was it was unbelievable. It it tears me up even when I talk about it because I remember how important that conversation was to me. Tell me about the football career. How deep did you play? So I played into college. Uh, I played at Ottawa University for two years, and then my head coach got transferred to uh, Lindenwood University. And my head coach at the time was only like two years older than I am, so our dynamic was a little different. Um, I used to, you know, we would sit and talk about life, you know, and his kids and family, and we had a very different dynamic than the 18 year old freshman that was coming in. And I was a 25 year old freshman coming in and then he got this job. And I remember during Christmas break, I called him cause he was having a child and his, he just had the birth of his, his youngest daughter. So I called him to congratulate him. I said, Hey coach, congratulations. He goes, Oh man, he goes, thanks man. I appreciate it. It's a really big change for us. You know, St. Louis is a different city. I'm like, and I was kind of baffled. I don't go, I go, what are you talking about? He goes, Oh, you're not, I got hired. I got a new job. I go, no, no, I was calling about about Cade, and he's like, oh, "Oh, yeah, thanks, thanks." And I go, "Well, tell me about this new job." And he's like, "Well, I got the new I got the new job at Lindenwood University." And I go, "Where's that?" He goes, "It's in St. Charles, Missouri." I said, "Okay." And he goes, "I can't recruit you," so and I go, "Well, you don't have to recruit me. I'm I'm coming." 
because, I mean, I went to Ottawa for him, so I'm going to go with him. We just won the conference championship, so I get to Lindenwood, and he's like, hey, you know, you're 27. We've got – you've got a ring. I can help you start your career and, and make you the DFO. Uh, and that's what I did, and I was the youngest DFO in the country at the time and also the only undergrad uh, – Currently in school, taking classes and DFO of a uh, university. And DFO is director of football director operations. Director of football. So that's, you're, you're, you know, you're running everything, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, and, you know, I had a, I, I was in an office with another coach who I love dearly, Coach Craig Schuler, who's no longer with us, but he taught me a lot, and I, I learned a lot about the business of football and the operation of football rather than just being on the player side. I learned now the, how to run a team and how it operates with scholarshiping and recruiting you know, traveling. I mean, it was a lot, and I soaked it all in while I could, and, you know, it was helpful. So I've hit kind of every gamut of the sport of football. I was in ops, I was an agent, and now I've been scouting. So I've kind of run the gamut here. What uh, position did you play? I played offensive line. Uh, I was a defensive lineman in high school, then I moved to offensive line in college. Um, But I thought I was a quarterback, to be honest with you. Everybody thinks you're a quarterback. Yeah, and I was a quarterback. The funny story about that was I was a quarterback my whole – youth career until I got to high school and my freshman year my very first practice my head coach was Wes Chandler I don't know if you remember that name or not and uh as he you know we we all got together and he goes hey uh all right everybody go to your positions and get started so I'm jogging to the quarterbacks because I I I thought I was a quarterback and uh he's like hey where are you going I said (laughs) going to quarterbacks coach he goes not anymore you're not Go to defensive line (laughs) so I was like I was I had no I've never played defensive line in my life I had no idea what to do and that's how I, that's how I made the position change. <laughs> so you went from being a quarterback to chasing quarterbacks. Yeah, to I was a 290 pound freshman quarterback to now 290 pound defensive lineman. How many sacks you get? I, honestly, I can't remember. I, I don't. I, I had you know. So my freshman year, I had eye surgery. I had major eye surgery. I had a cornea transplant. So I only played um, my freshman year, and then I couldn't play my sophomore junior year because of my surgery. Then I played my senior year. Um, and so I, I, I don't remember. I was so long ago. I don't remember much of what I did. So you've been on the, the football path for a long time. Then, yeah, right? yeah. Um, My family is very sporty. My yeah. brother he played college football um, in Kansas as well. He played semi-pro football, played arena football, um, and now works in television for NBC Olympics. And then we've got family members who are Major League Baseball umpires. And so we're oh, really? pretty I have a, I have a nephew who was the head ho- women's hockey coach at Navy. So our family is pretty athletic and sporty to say the least. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. you got, I imagine the discussions uh, during the holidays around the table are pretty good. Oh, yeah, it gets yeah. fun and heated, and everyone's got their own opinion. My brother and I, we, uh, we, I, I think we try to get to the same place or just our paths get there a little different, <laughs> a little differently, so it always makes for a fun conversation. Where's home? Uh, Daytona Beach, Florida, born yeah. and raised. Born and raised, yeah. So in the sunshine all the time. That's it. I'm the only one in my family that was born in Florida. The only one. Really? Yeah. My, Where's everybody else born? Dad's from New Jersey. My brother's born in New Jersey. My mother's born in Ohio. Yeah. But uh, you, you were born there and grew up there. Complete. I'm the, and you can tell I'm a complete opposite. So you're getting football left, right, and center that's in Florida, it. right? Because that's such a football state. <laughs> well, I actually grew up a Braves fan. I was a huge Braves fan yeah. at the time. I've uh, seen that on your social media. I'm a huge Braves fan. I grew up an Expos fan, so I hate the Braves. Yeah, I can imagine. So you know. yeah, yeah, and I'm sorry. <laughs> you know. um, but I grew up a huge baseball fan. In fact, baseball was my first sport. Um, and then I got into football. I really actually wasn't even into college football as a kid either. I got into it um, probably when I got into high school more. Um, but I was a Dolphins fan growing up. We didn't have the Jags at the time. Uh, so it was either the Bucks or the Dolphins. And my dad was a, a – do- he loved Dan Marino. And yeah. so I was a huge Dan Marino fan growing up. Yeah. I was going to say, what era? What's, who's your favorite player? So Dan so, Marino. So my favorite Dolphin of all time, uh, it's hard, uh, is probably – I mean, everyone will say Dan Marino if yeah. they really know the, the Dolphins because we don't have much to be proud of since him. But um, my favorite Brave of all time is uh, Dale Murphy, will always be number three. Um, and then I got into hockey later in life. Uh, which was awesome. And I, so between that, my high school schooling and going to college, I worked for – my grandfather calls me up, typical off-the-boat Greek. says, hey, uh, go see Theo George. He's going to give you a job. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> okay. So I show up at this pizza place, and Theo George was Uncle George. Uncle George gives me a job as a dishwasher. I, was, cause I, I guess this is how you had to start as a – you know. And they were from Toronto. So as I stayed there, I remember during football season, his son, jo- um, John, was, the, was running the place. And it was a uh, Florida-Georgia football game was on. But that's in November when hockey starts. And he wouldn't change the channel. He wanted to watch the Leafs because he's a Leafs fan. And I said, you know what, John? I said, whoever plays the Leafs today, 
That's going to be my favorite. I never watched hockey in my life. I go, that would be my favorite hockey team of all time. And it ended up being the Flyers. The Flyers beat the Leafs that year. That's when they had Lindros, LeClaire, yeah. you know, Hextall, uh, that Paul Coffey. And I became a huge, huge Flyers fan. And Simon Gagne is my favorite Flyer. Of all really? Time. And are you still a hockey fan now? You still watch a lot? I don't. I, I lost it somehow yeah. in transition of working harder and more work coming in where I couldn't just watch – hockey all the time and i've been to a lot of good games i went to the game six of the leafs and, or uh the flyers and lightning uh eastern conference finals in tampa it was yeah. awesome yeah so i really enjoyed it so and now that i'm here working in a for a canadian team the last two years i've been up for camp a, a florida team has been in the playoffs so i always yeah. say oh man i'm a lightning fan or this year i'm a panthers fan we're gonna win yeah. this thing and i have no clues on the team yeah as we <laughs> as we tape this uh, we're waiting for the stanley cup final to start with the with the Florida Panthers and yeah. the Vegas Golden Knights. So uh, Florida must be uh, – I mean, that whole area, they must be – like they're just blessed with sports right now. The Heat are in the NBA final. The yeah. baseball teams uh, are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the Rays are having a great year. Yeah. Uh, that's a uh, – you know, the Buccaneers won the Super Bowl just a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a blessed sports market right now well, down you know, in Florida. I think people come, and I think good athletes come, because we don't have a state tax there. Yeah. So they come, they want to be in Florida, they don't have to pay a state tax, and they can save a ton of money by playing in Florida, which I, I think... the weather's nice, too. And, well, yeah, it's, yeah, and my grandfather used to say, this is paradise, because I, no, I used to say, let's move back to Ohio, and he's like, no, he would, no, yeah. this is paradise, he used yeah. to tell me. So, yeah, I'd say it's pretty cool to be there. Yeah, and now you're working for the Edmonton Elks, yep. uh, you come to Canada, and after you, you grew up in Florida in the warm weather, your yep. goal as a professional now is to play in the coldest game possible, the yeah. Grey Cup game <laughs> yeah. in November. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy. It's uh, I got here last year for the first time, uh, and day one it snowed. Um, so this year I was like, oh, I'm coming prepared because it's going to be cold. So I have like maybe two pairs of shorts that I brought yeah. with me and all winter gear. And the day I get here, it's 80 <laughs> degrees. And I was just like, I, I don't know what to do here. Like I threw my hands up like I, I didn't bring any. I have no short sleeve, anything. I had to get everything from Dan in the equipment room. Um, so it's. It's been beautiful here. I, I, yeah. I can't complain about the weather in Edmonton. Yeah, the weather. Well, training camp weather is usually the best weather. Yeah. Uh, there was a little, little, little iffy last year, but uh, yeah. training camp weather is usually great. You usually get one day when you get 30 Celsius, which is about as hot as we get here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you, you, you've, been, you've been blessed again this year. Great, great weather for training camp. No um, I want to talk a little bit about about scouting and, and your philosophy, and I imagine that lines up with Chris Jones's philosophy as well. And I know you guys kind of, I don't know if you changed the philosophy, but just changed how you find guys yep. this year, right? And you went to a lot of different places to find guys. I know um, Chris left here in October last year, and it took him a long time to drive home because he had about 50 stops on the way home at yep. schools and stuff. How did that go? How did the plan go to, to find guys in different areas, whether it be Division three, Division two, or indoor yep. uh, football league or whatever? How, how do you feel it went? So last year, I, what right towards the end of the season where we kind of knew we were out of it at, some, at the point where we couldn't get into the playoffs, we kind of turned our attention to this year. Knowing that we put together a pretty good base core of, of the team uh, with what we did last year, um, we were pretty happy with the guys that we figured that we're, this was the core of our team. Now we need to need to help them out. So uh, Chris Giro and myself, uh, we we basically took the whole country and divided it up by divisions. And I got my group of teams. Chris got his. Giro got his. And and Ben Meineker got his. You know, everyone kind of kind of get a piece of the scouting yesterday, last year. And so we went through and we watched every single player in every single division, in every conference, every single one that was going to be a senior this year. So we went through, and, and we just kind of ranked them, and, and we have a spreadsheet going of every single kid. We ranked them of what their status with us would be, you know, whether we're a guy who we would put on the neg list or a guy we would sign or a guy we, we just thought was a workout guy, that kind of thing. And then right as the season ended, Chris is like, you know, let, let put a plan together for me. I'm going to drive home, and I'm going to stop at every single school I can. And he stopped at about 40 schools from Edmonton to South Pittsburgh. And it was so beneficial for for all of us because, you know, I'd have to call in and build relationships with a lot of these schools that, you know, I never went into before. And just kind of let them know, hey, our head coach is going to be there in five minutes, which is uh, <laughs> which is amazing in itself because they usually give us schedules for us to do that. But, you know, we're – we're about you know breaking down the barriers here. So 
we we just went to every school. We knew who we were going to see. We already knew the players. We already knew their background, where they're from, what they did. Um, and it was helpful because when after this, the Christmas season came and we come into January, we already knew. We went to the Hula Bowl and to the, in, in January, and we, already, we knew half the roster because maybe about 10 of them were on our neck list already. So we already knew what we were going to see, and now we can evaluate those guys who we want. And it was just extremely helpful. The work that we did um, in that time period of that two months, like October or November, December, and part of October, it was – It's. I mean, you see the product, what we're doing now. Yeah. Where's the strangest place you went to? Where's the place you went to that you thought you'd never be at scouting football? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was at um, – where did I go? I went to um, Wingate College. Uh, it's in North Carolina. Never thought I'd ever go there. I also went to a school in Georgia, um, LaGrange. Never thought mm-hmm. I'd ever go there. Uh, and that's the thing. Like, we, we didn't discriminate on the school, the division, um, anything like that. We went and saw everybody. If you were a guy who was top of, the, top of your conference, top of your team, we went to go see you. Mm-hmm. And, or, or we contacted you in some way. And we watched film on all of them. i got to ask you, yeah. uh, who found Shannon Brooks? <laughs> uh, G-Roy, yeah. But I will say this, you know, and I, we, this is something that – we do here, we, and people always ask who found this guy, who found yeah. this guy, and we we all as scouts are like, exactly. oh, I brought this guy in, but we run this thing as a we. Yeah. So we found Shannon Brooks. Yeah. Uh, he just happened to go to G Roy first. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> so, I totally, I totally, you're yeah. all working for the same team. I yeah. totally understand that, but I know yeah. guys, scouts find guys, whatever sport it is, they yeah. find guys that they champion and they want to. No doubt. And there's, there's legendary stories over the years. I think the first one I ever heard was Bobby Clark. For the Philadelphia Flyers, yeah. a diabetic kid out of Flin Flon. Jerry <laughs> Melnick, a scout from Edmonton, find him and had to virtually bully his way in to get the Flyers to draft him. Yeah. And he turned out to be their captain and uh, yeah. hoist the Stanley Cup a couple of times. Uh, is there a guy, in? and I don't mean just this year's team, is there a guy that you've scouted over the years that you're really proud of and say, like, that's my guy? Uh, yeah, Kyron Moore. I mean, yeah. I, I'm the one who found Kyron. Um, and... And that was happenstance, too. He wasn't even supposed to be where I found him. Uh, they just – UCF – we had a, t- a hurricane, and UCF had to move a game. They couldn't find an opponent. Austin P takes the game. I tell Chris I'm going to go see this Austin P because they're from Tennessee. And he's like, oh, I know the head coach. Make sure you go say hi. So, I, I, you know, just my regular scouting day, I go to the game. I go to the field. I go do my body typing. I go talk to the coach. And he runs me through all these guys. He doesn't even mention Kyron Moore in the beginning because uh, Kyron just came from injury. And it was his first game back. And as I'm leaving him, he goes, hey, coach, you might want to check out this number four, too. He goes, he's special. He just hasn't played yet, so we don't know what we're going to get out of him today. Well, 363 yards of offense later <laughs> on the number one team in the country by himself. Uh, I, I, was in the, I was in the press box just feverishly texting uh, at the time was John Murphy and Mike Davis. And, and then you're scouting for Saskatchewan. Right? Scouting for Saskatchewan yeah. at the time. And, and then finally I just started calling Chris. I'm like, we got to put this guy on the neck. Got to do it now. Uh, you know, Danny Mack was sitting next to me because he was seeing the same things I were, and it just ha- we just happened to get him on first. And uh, I'm Swerve's the best man. He is such a great kid. I'm sure you've talked to him or seen him since you've been here. He's never down. He's super positive and he's very good at what he does. And he's going to be very good this year. Everybody loves him in the locker room. He's got a family now, so I'm really proud of him. He's a small kid from Bessemer, Alabama just outside of Birmingham, uh, just great kid all around. It's cool. It's neat, those stories. You talk about Danny Mack sitting beside you. Like, scouts don't play the game, but they still play a game, right? Oh, yeah. And, and you're looking for guys, and yeah. you're not giving anybody any information, yeah. and you're trying to get them on the neg list before he does. And yeah. it's, that's it, kind of a cool angle. It is. Him and I share the, the booth together all the time because he's from Florida as well. Mm-hmm. So we actually are the only two that see each other. We don't see any other teams typically. Um, so him and I are in a, a, lot of, a lot of press boxes together. We see a lot of the same things together, and him and I are in a constant battle. Now, he his his own, his advantage over me is he can nag people right from his phone. Yeah, I have a channel to go through. Yeah. I still have to go to G Roy, but G Roy is super quick. If he if he has his phone and he gets it right away, we'll do it. Um, but Danny, gets, you know, Danny and I, we 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 have a great time. We're good friends, and him and I, like you said, you know, in our league, protecting a player is like the most important thing we can do. You know, and uh, him and I battle about that all the time. So. I want to go back to something you said, body typing. Yeah. What is that? So body typing is – so when you get a roster, it always says the guy's 6'3", 230 pounds, and you walk onto the field, 
and you walk up to the guy who's the same height as you, which is now six foot or five eleven and one hundred and forty pounds. So when you go and body type a player, I basically go down there and. When I get to the stadium, we go through the roster prior to the stadium. I'll have the sheet of who we're going to go take a look at, and we'll know just based on their height and weight if that's a guy that fits the positions that we want. And if they are, then I go to see how long they are, how they bend, uh, how big their hands are, you know, how you know, how how their lower half works, how big their thighs are, if they're an offensive lineman, what their anchor looks like. Um, and that kind of gives us an idea – of what we're getting as far as, you know, length and, and width and kind of bend that we need to look at with these guys. And Chris, from what I understand, is very particular. He wants his DBs to look like this. He wants his linebackers to look like that. And he wants his old linemen to look like that. Yeah, yeah, extremely particular. And, uh, you know, just being with him. I've known Chris for 20 years, you know, and I've been giving him players as an agent for, for the first 15 of or 14 mm-hmm. of them and working for him for the last six or seven and uh, yeah, he, I, I, you just know what he wants, and it has to. We, he has uh, one of his coaches told him one time, if you're, or I think it was Bill Parcells actually told him, if you're going to be six foot at corner, then you need to be six foot at corner, no exceptions. So that's the way we live, live by the rule. And if he wants a six foot corner and above, that's all we're looking for, six foot and above. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been successful because he's got a pretty good track record. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt. He's, yeah. uh, he's a guru when it comes to – especially in the secondary. That's like his main yeah. – defensive line and secondary are his two like, uh, like, like uh, main positions where he's like, you know, the I, – I measure all DBs and especially cornerbacks via Chris Jones with Patrick Watkins. Yes. Because that's one of the first guys he brought in here in 2014 yeah. when he signed his, as a coach of the uh, yeah. of, uh, of the double E then. And Patrick Watkins was one of the first. And he's a great player, big and tall and rangy, and he, he's athletic, yeah. and that's what he wants there. Yeah, Pat Watkins was about 6'4", and, and he was as from here. He could probably touch the other side of the stadium from here. He was so long. And the thing about Pat Watkins wasn't like a, he was fast, but he wasn't overly fast, but he could be a little less fast than the guys that he typically wants because – his his length and his reach was so long he could be two yards behind a guy yeah. and just reach up and, and he's right there with him. So his hand gets there he, faster yeah, than his was, body does. Yeah, his, his he was definitely one of those like uh, you know one of those guys you look at and you're like wow. Uh, you've been working with Chris since 2016 yep. in Saskatchewan. Yeah. How did you guys meet? Uh, so Chris and, not, Chris and my brother are actually good buddies before I met um, through the agent work, and yeah. you know, we were doing the agent business. And then um, I introduced Chris. Um, so Chris would come down to Florida and do workouts, and I would just meet him through there, and we kind of took a liking to each other. Um, I think, you know, Chris being a, a smaller guy likes bigger guys around him, you know. So <laughs> uh, I think he kind of gravitated towards me a little bit, like kind of like uh, Robin Big from the MTV show. Yeah. <laughs> and uh so we just kind of, you know, him and I just have great similar personalities. And, uh, you know, I understand where, what my position is with him and when it's, you know, Chris and when it's coach, you know. Um, so I, we have a really good dynamic in that regard. You ever stumped them with a player? Told him somebody he didn't know about yeah, or, Chris or didn't know his Chris, 40 yeah, time or didn't know his, uh, how high he jumped? never admit that he doesn't know a guy. Um, but, uh, no, I don't think. I, I Offhand, I can't think of one that I was like, hey, you know this guy? And he's like, no. Like he and he probably doesn't know, but he'll never let you know. He's yeah. never gonna tell me he didn't know who that guy was. But I, I, you've talked to him. He, this guy is the most. His, his he's got so much RAM in his brain. His, <laughs> like there's so much room for information that when it comes to football, and it comes to football players, where they're from, what they ran, what they jump, what school, where he transferred from, what his daddy did for a living. You know, he's got it all stored. I mean, the RAM in his brain is unbelievable. Yeah. And he, he's the smartest guy in football I've ever talked to. Yeah, indeed. There's a lot up there. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. um, as we talk, we're just ending, coming near the end of training camp. Elks will open up the regular season June 11th against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. You can head to goelks.com for uh, ticket information and Ticketmaster as well. For uh, You get those guaranteed uh, win tickets as well, which are, are still out there. Big night coming up on opening night. Tell me about training camp for you. How have you enjoyed it, and, and has it worked out the way you, you'd hoped it had worked out? I know for me, Shannon Brooks, is he's the diamond in the rough from training camp. He's yeah. the guy, you know. The numbers are there to tell you, 144 yards rushing in two games, yeah. playing, not playing whole games either. Uh, he's been the guy. But how's, how have you enjoyed camp, and how's it worked out for you? So the thing about camp for us and personnel is, like, you know, it's like a – it's a symphony. You know, you put – you you go out and find every part of the, of the of the orchestra, the trumpets, the violins, the oboes, the basses, the cellos, the flutes, the horns, and then you come and you watch Chris conduct 
and see how it plays out because we spend all this time researching and putting together this symphony and we wait for Chris to conduct and play the music. And that's what's, that's what we do here. You know, so we, we spent all this time and, you know, right before uh, the first game at Calgary, you know, the three of us, you know, we dap each other up and say, Hey, great job. You know, now we're here. Let's, let's finish this thing. So it's really cool. Uh, and, and the players are awesome, man. They've been, I, I talk to a lot of them during when I leave here and go back home through, through either social media or I'll text them. Uh, you know, last year with Taylor, you know, I texted Taylor every game before every game just to give them, just to say, Hey, you know, we believe in you, you know, keep up the good work, you know, and be smart. You know, just, I just, I just, these guys are really, really cool. And it's a really cool experience for me because I'm only here for a short period of time and I try to soak it all in, you know, get to see all the faces and then I'm gone for the rest of the year. It must be kind of neat because you see the end product. You know, you do so much yeah. work getting these guys here. It must be neat to, to be here for camp. And then even, a, I know you're staying for the first, at least the first game. Yep. Uh, it must be neat to kind of just, see the you know the the end game of of your hard work yeah and you know we have a few more days left in camp so the roster's not fully done but it's about 95 percent of the way and I, i'd be i'd be lying if i didn't say that playing sask in the first game didn't have a little bit to do why i'm staying through the first <laughs> week um but also a cool thing that, that i wanted to do last year that i left early for was there's uh there's four lindenwood coaches on the sask uh oh. coaching staff so and which I was the proprietor of why they're all there, and I I just I wanted to stay and take a picture with those guys and send it to the university so they could be proud of you know, you know having their coaches that came through there now five of us are in the uh, and one of them I coached, so I nice. my brother coached one in high school I coached one in college and then they all expanded and brought the other guys. That's, so that, that's cool how the football world just yeah, you never really know cool. when you're going to hook up with somebody or see somebody yeah. that you played with or coached with many many years ago. Yeah, so I, I, that's going to be a cool experience for us. Um, but also, I want to I want to win I, I, by a lot. It's so. sass, great. Everybody, yeah. I just want right? <laughs> I just want to win by a lot. I just I can't wait to see it unfold and and like I said, the orchestra will play. Where are you headed after you leave here? What's so, your schedule like? Yeah, so I'm going to do some school visits on the way home. I drove up this year, uh, 46 hours to da beautiful Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, but I'm probably going to take me about 10 days because I'm going to do some school visits. Uh, I'm going to go to Colorado, University of Colorado. I was invited to come um, by the coaching staff there. So I'm going to go to University of Colorado. You know, I'm going to get through the Dakotas uh, and go see, see them as well. Uh, Chris went through there last year. So they know who we are. Um, so I'm going to go through this year and get their senior list and kind of just make my way down, to just like Chris did, but a lot less time. That's prime time, right? Yeah, prime yeah. time, yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see. I actually, uh, when I was in the agent business, one of the kids I represented is now a defensive line coach for him. Yeah. So um, he, he's like, hey, why don't you come down and stop and see us? And so yeah. I figured I'd stop by. That's a, that's a, he's weaving a pretty good coaching story, isn't he? Oh, yeah. And he he's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty impressive what he's doing there. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, okay, uh, this is it, uh, the red zone time. Uh, right. Three questions to get you out on. Uh, <laughs> same questions we ask everybody. We change them up once in a while, but for sure. the most part, we ask everybody. So here we go, Sammy Gahagan in the red zone. Uh, first CFL game you ever saw? Uh, first one I saw was in 2010. I think it was 10. Um, I watched Toronto when Chris was in Toronto. Um, I remember EJ Qualley fielded a kickoff and punted it back during that game and i didn't know what was happening <laughs> what is happening here <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that was i can't remember which which week it was but that was the first one i watched yeah uh, it's just funny talking to so many guys who come up from the states and they don't know the rules and yeah it's like why are we punting on third down or yes what the what's why is everyone off the off the line so yeah. much it's interesting how it, it takes some guys a little while yeah. to just figure out the great nuances of this sport yeah i remember that like it happened 30 seconds ago i remember the kickoff he caught the ball he punted it back and i was like what just happened i, I was like i was i was amazed <laughs> all right question number 2 your best football memory playing coaching scouting watching anything oh man so, um one of <laughs> oh man i got a lot of good memories player coaching watching scouting jeez um here's a good one uh i went to go see uh, my niece's senior night in Atlanta, she was a cheerleader, and my 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 cousin was like, "Hey, there's a kicker here who's pretty good." I said, "Oh, okay, I'll go watch him." So I'm at a high school game, and I and I had a kicker named Sebastian Janikowski in my high school, so I 
I've seen good kicking. And so I'm watching this kid kick, and he's booting the ball, and he's boot. I'm just like, man, this kid's got a bomb on him. He's le- just strongest leg I'd seen on a high school kid in a long time. Probably since Sebastian, actually. So after the game, I, I'm going to the I'm going to the, I'm going to the, to the restroom, and he's in the restroom next to me. And I say, hey man, I wanted to let you know you're. I think you're gonna be a good kicker one day. Just keep up at it. That kid was Harrison Butker. Oh. And I had no idea it was Harrison Butker. Oh. And then I didn't. He goes to Georgia Tech. I didn't even think twice about it. And then he gets drafted by the Chiefs, and it still didn't dawn on me that that was the kid. I yeah. And I, my cousin always tells me, "Oh, you stalked the kid in the bathroom, remember?" And, I, yeah. and I'm like, "I go, yeah. I go. I, at least I was good at what I. I had a good eye because I told him he was going to be pretty good. Yeah. So Harrison Butker. Yeah, he turned out good. All right. Uh, third question. Biggest name in your phone? Oh man. Well, biggest name probably Vince Carter. That's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, what's your relationship with him? We went to school together, middle oh, really? school. Yeah. yeah, we grew up together in Daytona. Air Canada. Air Canada. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you got you got the basketball interest too, then? Eh? Yeah. yeah. Well, just when he was there, I hadn't yeah. watched a game since he retired either. <laughs> so, um, and I, that that number might not work anymore. I just keep it in for the nostalgia. And you know, to be honest, he might be Victor Kui. He might be my, uh, my uh, biggest yeah. name yeah. at this point. That might be the biggest name in my yeah. phone too. So I think he's know. my second billionaire in there. So <laughs> he's good. You should have heard the names he's got in his phone. I heard them. Go back. Yeah. Yeah. Go, they're yeah. impressive. It's, it's very impressive. I, I, I was I was really impressed very with that impressive. list. I, I was getting there at one point, but not anymore. All right. Uh, uh, Sammy Gahagan, yeah. thanks for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, tell me, between now and when we have Jan Antler up at the start of next season again, yeah. how many football games are you going to watch? Watch? Yeah. <laughs> a thousand probably, I would think. I mean, I got, I'll got. i watch every single game that the league has, our league plays. I'll watch probably – I. so I should have taken a picture of my office at home. I've got, I've got five screens going at one time wow. with all games going on every Saturday and Sunday. Nice. So, yeah, you figure 10, 10 a weekend for uh, probably a 1,000, I'd say. Watch a 1,000 games and shaking a lot of trees that's and looking it. under a lot of rocks. Yeah, right? and then I'll be vi- – not, that's not counting the schools I'll be visiting during yeah. that time too. So Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Sammy, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, that is episode uh, one for season two of Antler Up. Overall, episode 21. Don't forget to, uh, to like. Don't forget to share. Don't forget to uh, – just be here every week because we're going to drop, as I said, uh, every uh, every week, before day before the game, we're going to drop a new episode. Looking forward to another season of Antler Up. Touchdown, Antler Up, Edmonton, touchdown Elks. Taylor Cornelius takes it himself as he got an open lead to the end zone. Antler Up, Edmonton, touchdown Elks.